Good afternoon, everyone. It's so wonderful to see you, and thank you all for uh, being here uh, today. My name is Richard Locke. I'm a professor of international and public affairs and political science and currently serve as uh, the provost. And it's a, a real uh, joy to be able to be here with you today uh, and, uh, and to hear from uh, our colleague and friend uh, uh, Peter, who's talking about his latest uh, book, uh, Rebel Mother, which those of you who had a chance to read it, it's an amazing, uh, it's quite an amazing uh, book. I'm going to just um, give a very brief uh, interview, talk a little bit about the format and ground rules, and then turn it over uh, to, uh, to Peter. So uh, many of you uh, know Peter uh, quite well. Uh, he is the John Hay Professor of International Studies here at Brown. He's a professor also of international public affairs and uh, political science. Uh, he uh, joined uh, the institute in 2001. Uh, and uh, previously, he had uh, worked at uh, Reed uh, College, had been an uh, academy scholar at Harvard University, a uh, research fellow at Brookings, uh, and also an SSRC MacArthur Foundation Fellow of International Peace uh, and Security. Uh, he got his uh, MA and PhD in government at Cornell and his BA uh, in political science at uh, Swarthmore. Um, Peter is just one of these truly unique and wonderful combinations of uh, serious uh, scholars, uh, innovative uh, and gifted uh, teachers, and just really a wonderful uh, colleague. I was very fortunate uh, to um, get to know Peter when I came here in 2013. He was the associate director um, of, uh, of the Watson Institute and translated Brown, uh, and we were partners in, in crime for a couple of years uh, trying to uh, reimagine uh, the Watson Institute, uh, which I think uh, has done uh, extremely, uh, extremely well. Aside from uh, being truly a gifted uh, teacher, he is a prolific and very high-impact uh, scholar. He is the author, co-author, and co-editor of 10 books. Uh, previous to this book, he uh, uh, published uh, a terrific book called Smuggler Nation, How Illicit Trade Made America, which is something that we should be reminded of these days. Uh, it came out in 2013, and it was uh, selected by Amazon and by Foreign Affairs as one of the very best books um, of the year. Uh, uh, before that, he wrote a, actually a really, again, uh, I thought it was one of the first books that I read of, uh, of Peter's, which was uh, Blue Helmets and Black Markets, The Business of Survival and the Siege of Sarajevo. Um, really a terrific uh, book that talks about a particular uh, moment uh, in history. And I think what this does, what Sm Smuggler Nation does, and also with uh, Rebel uh, Mother, is that it actually takes a issue. Um, whether it's like what's going on um, during the siege of Sarajevo or how do we think about illicit trade and smuggling. And it takes this issue that you think is kind of a little off-center but shows how it's actually central to the way that we understand key phenomena. Uh, political phenomena, international relations uh, phenomena uh, as well. He's done a lot of work on, on uh, issues of border. Uh, he's now working uh, on uh, issues of, of drugs uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and the way that we understand it. And I think that this is really one of the um, truly um, unique gifts of Peter, is the way that he's able to take these issues, show that they're very relevant to the mainstream, but talk about them in a way that you're actually engaged and you read the book and you, uh, it's very, very accessible. So uh, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to have you as a, uh, as a colleague uh, and, uh, and friend. This book, which we're going to be t hearing about today, and hopefully all of you had a chance to look at it. If not, uh, I think they were going to be uh, sold outside. It's just an incredible book that blends together uh, a story of um, Peter's mom, a story of the relationship between Peter's mom uh, and uh, himself uh, over time, but especially uh, uh, when he was young, but also the story of what was going on politically uh, in this country and also abroad in a certain era. And weaving together those different narratives in an incredibly creative way, I think, makes this a very compelling story and actually brings to life, makes it personal and real what was going on in this era and how people were uh, responding to it. So it's, again, uh, a really terrific uh, uh, book. The format is going to be that Peter's going to talk a little bit about the book for maybe about a half hour, uh, and then afterwards uh, we'll sit together over there and I'll kick off the discussion by asking him uh, a couple questions, uh, and then we'll open it up uh, to the uh, broader uh, audience uh, for a Q&A uh, session. Now, I want to uh, remind everyone that this uh, session is actually being uh, taped by C-SPAN. 
uh, which is fantastic. Uh, and, uh, and that means two things. One is please turn off your phones um, and because uh, that wouldn't be uh, great. Uh, and the second one is if you, when you have questions, uh, please just wait for a minute for the microphone because otherwise uh, people won't hear the questions uh, during the recording. And with that, let me turn it over to Peter and thank you for bringing us this wonderful piece of work. So please join us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming on this wet, gray, cold day. It doesn't quite feel like spring yet. Um, the reason uh, Rick um, uh, gave the introduction is not simply because I knew he'd give this really glowing intro, uh, or that he's the provost of the university, but rather because, as, despite that, yes, um, but because when he first arrived at Brown, we worked very closely together, and he was the first person here who figured out I was writing this book. And those of you who know Rick know he, know he has an extra antenna for these things. He kind of figures out what's going on quicker than most. And so not only did he figure out I was writing this book, but he wanted to see it right away, like immediately. So I gave him that draft, which was really t not a very good draft at that point. And he took it, and I think he read it overnight. He has insomnia, so he basically reads overnight. Um, and gave me great comments the next day or the next day after that. Uh, so I'm grateful because um, this is a book that I, um, you know, I did not uh, broadcast widely I, that I was working on. In fact, I didn't quite believe it was happening until I actually had a publisher. Uh, so Rick was an important early source of um, a support on this on this project. Um, it's not your typical political science book, uh, obviously. I'm not wearing my political science hat today. Um, but I should say it's about politics. So um, there's continuity here with my other work. And in fact, it's possibly the most deeply political thing I've ever written. Um, and you know, it, it basically uh, reflects the old saying, the personal is political. And it's impossible to imagine me being a political scientist today if it wasn't for this intensely political childhood. Um, so it's a story that I've long had in my head, didn't know what to do with, uh, long thought about writing something at some point in my life about, but I never got around to it. And I never really thought I had enough raw material to work with. I didn't entirely trust memory to produce a book. Um, so what made this possible? Well, tragically, uh, it was my mother's death that made this possible. Uh, she died very suddenly, unexpectedly. And um, going through her things, um, I discovered her diaries covering decades. In fact, her diary was sitting next to her bed where she died. Uh, and the last line in her diary was, I think I'm having a heart attack. So that's where her diary ends, and, but it goes back decades to my childhood. And so um, I started reading and couldn't stop reading. And as her son, but also as a researcher, and I think, my goodness, I've got a book here. Um, so part of reading the diaries was therapeutic, but part of it was, oh my goodness, I can actually finally tell this story. Um, so what is this book about? It's a book about life on the run with my radical mother. You know, we basically covered, you know, three states and five countries and lived in a dozen homes and I went to a dozen schools between the ages of five and 11. Uh, I skipped various grades, uh, missed certain grades, um, much of the time wasn't even in school at all. Um, so it's a personal story in that sense, but it's also a story about, um, a radical era. And so as Rick alluded to in his intro, in some ways the story captures the era told through this particular family drama. Um, the 60s and 70s tore the country apart in many ways, well it also tore some families apart, and this was uh, one of them. So what I'm going to do today, and this is also very different for me, I'm not going to just talk about the argument in the book and the evidence presented and, and so on. Uh, I will actually do some reading, um, which is a little different style of presentation for me. 
Um, I should mention, for, you know, those of you, most of you have not even looked at the book, of course, um, but the diaries not only provided, gave me the confidence to write the story, but actually weave the diaries um, and her letters and correspondence and so on uh, throughout the book. And in fact, I, it, it made it possible for me to actually do something I've never done in writing before, which is dialogue. Mem memoirs have dialogue. It took me a while to adjust to writing dialogue, but I, I did, and she was such a good writer in her diaries that I was actually able to basically extend and use that material to come up with actual dialogue. So if you wonder how I came up with some of the stuff in the book, mostly the diaries. Um, all right, so I will, um, this is very selective readings. Basically the idea is, is capture different moments in the story. Uh, and I will jump ahead um, to September 11, 1973. Just after 9 a.m. on September 11, 1973, Rosa, Pedro, and I huddled around the radio in the kitchen, listening intently as President Salvador Allende broadcast what were to be his last publicly spoken words. Pedro and I had just gotten back from our first round of tending to the cows, horses, and other animals when Rosa yelled out for us to hurry in to listen to the radio. La Moneda, the presidential palace in Santiago, was being bombed. The military was staging a coup with the support of the country's disgruntled wealthy elite and the covert encouragement of the United States, which saw Allende as part of a growing communist threat in the region. Allende vowed never to give up to the military. He would be dead within hours. The junta was, that was taking over would claim he committed suicide with an AK-47 assault rifle given to him by Fidel Castro. Allende's voice on the radio was solemn yet defiant. Long live Chile, long live the people, long live the workers. These are my last words, and I am certain that my sacrifice will not be in vain. I am certain that, at the very least, it will be a moral lesson that will punish felony, cowardice, and treason. When the radio fell silent, I could think only of my mother. Where was she? Was she safe? Would I ever see her again? Barely eight, I didn't fully comprehend the political situation, but I was fluent enough in Spanish at this point to understand Allende's words and knew enough to recognize that my mother could be in danger. After all, she was an active supporter of the leftist government that had just been violently overthrown. Indeed, her complaint about Allende was that he hadn't been leftist enough. Her sympathies were actually with the more radical Chilean Mir, Movimiento de Izquierda Revolucionaria, or Revolutionary Left Movement. She thought Allende should have distributed arms to the workers in preparation for a possible military coup. I had not seen or heard from her in more than a month. I also had no idea how to reach my father or anyone else. At that moment, I felt more alone, more cut off than any other time in my life. I had been happy living on the farm, but now it suddenly seemed if I, if I was marooned there in the midst of a political hurricane. Allende's voice was gone forever. Rosa and Pedro sat staring at the radio in stunned silence. Rosa glanced over at me, forcing a tepid smile, perhaps trying to comfort me, but I could see the fear in her dark eyes. And so after El Golpe, the right-wing military coup by General Augusto Pinochet, the man who had ruled Chile for the next 17 years, I anxiously waited for my mother's return. My mind raced with scary possibilities. Was my mother imprisoned, tortured in a morgue, maybe in an unmarked grave, never to be found? And then I wondered what it would be like if I stayed there with Rosa's family. Would I end up with no sticks, no socks, like Octavio, sewing the tops and bottom of my shoes together to keep them from falling apart? Or would my father somehow find me and take me to the safety of Michigan? That thought was comforting, but also disturbing. It would mean my mother had never come back. 
Now, she did come back a few weeks later, but as you can imagine, those few weeks of waiting were rather traumatic. She and I, um, I'd been living on a farm uh, 500 kilometers south of Santiago when the coup happened, and uh, we were not together, and she showed up and, and, and took me with her. We then fled the country to Argentina um, shortly um, thereafter. Now I'm going to skip ahead, um, a little more lighthearted story. Um, we're now in Peru, um, in the Montado Valley, um, living with my mother's Peruvian boyfriend, who is half her age. Um, I am in a local public school, the only gringo anywhere around. Um, so this section is titled Piojos. As soon as I started school in Ocopilla in April 1974, the lice arrived. I tried to draw in my notebook while lice fell from my hair onto the page and crawled around in circles, as if they were trying to get my attention. I thought maybe they were falling off my head because it was so crowded there. There was not enough room for them all. I imagined bloody fistfights as the tiny monsters fought over the land, a white landscape of thousands of tiny eggs. At first I was startled, but the falling lice became so routine I barely noticed them. I would have been embarrassed, but many other kids at school had their own personal colonies of piojos. My mother spent many a late evening hour patiently combing the eggs out of my hair with a special fine-toothed comb. The affectionate grooming routine reminiscent of monkeys picking insects off each other. We tried everything, special soaps, shampoos, even resorted to kerosene, leaving an awful smell in my hair that lasted for days. Nothing worked. My mother probably spent more time combing lice eggs out of my hair than she did cooking. Even if she'd wanted to cook, it would have been much too difficult. All we had was that single burner hot plate, no fridge. So a meal at home usually meant crusty bread and jelly for breakfast, along with tea or coffee. After school, my mother and Raul, her boyfriend, were often at a political event. My mother paid a neighbor to feed me those nights. The meals were better than at home, but still pretty basic. Typically a bowl of rice, noodle soup, piece of bread, a main course consisting of a mix of rice, potatoes, and meat. Esteban, his wife, Julia, and their two daughters treated me like family. Esteban was especially nice to me when he was sober, but he always smelled like sweated alcohol. One night, Esteban announced that he had a cure for my lice problem. It had worked on his kids. Did I want to give it a try? His girls giggled. They wouldn't say what it was, though. It works, they promised. After dinner, he took me out back to the muddy fenced yard where the family kept their goats, chickens, and ducks. Lower your head, he instructed. I need to douse your hair. Stay still, don't move. I did exactly as he said, bending over as far as I could in the dark. A lukewarm shower of sticky salt water landed on my head. My senses swarmed in the unmistakable smell. Nothing stinks quite like urine. And there's nothing quite like having a pot of pee dumped on your head. Now rub it in real good, he said. Tentatively, I reached up and massaged the urine into my lice-infested scalp. Harder, use both hands. So I wouldn't offend him, I rubbed the pee into my head with gusto. I began to stand up, but he stopped me. You need, to just, you need just a bit more, he said. There was no pee left in the chamber pot. So he unzipped his pants, pulled out his penis, and released a hot stream right on my head, <laughs> taking care not to miss any spots. I was so drenched that even my ears were full. There, that should do it. Gagging, I desperately wanted to rinse my hair and wash off my salty face, but he stopped me again. Now, let it sit there for a little while, he said. It has to soak in. 
And so I sat patiently, P drawing on my eyelids, waiting for the minutes to tick by. It worked exactly as promised. It turned out that the lice living on my head were even more disgusted than I was. <laughs> A few weeks later, though, they were back in full force, perhaps because the other kids at school still had lice, procreating and laying eggs more enthusiastically than ever. But I didn't ask Esteban for another treatment. All right. Now, <clears throat> My mother and, and Raul, her Peruvian um, boyfriend, she was about 41 at this time, and he was about 21. They had a very intense relationship. Um, they also had a very intense political relationship. What I mostly remember about them, in fact, is arguing about politics. And fortunately, she has the blow-by-blow -blow of their politics in her diaries as well. So I reconstructed one big argument here that I'll re-narrate to you. As much as they loved each other, my mother and Rel could argue about pretty much anything, especially if it had anything to do with politics. Their political wrestling matches simultaneously infuriated and invigorated them. Some lasted for hours at any time of the day with brief rests in between. I hate Christ, Raul suddenly declared one day. He didn't seem to be trying to pick a fight, but my mother could not resist responding. It isn't necessary to hate Christ to struggle against the evils of Christianity. And off they went, a verbal fistfight between atheists. Was Jesus a proletariat or not? Was he really against the rich and powerful? Was he really a pacifist? If you believed in Christ, could you still believe in Lenin? No, said Raul. Yes, said my mother. If you defended Christ, were you a reactionary? No, insisted my mother. Yes, insisted Raoul. So that means you think I'm a reactionary, she said to Raoul, incredulous. He huffed and didn't reply. My mother told Raoul it was nice that Jesus wanted his disciples to wash each other's feet. Teaching humility, always it's the poor who are supposed to be humble, Raoul replied dismissively. My mother shot back, it isn't realistic to expect people to throw away all their lifelong religious beliefs in one jump. It's politically smarter to attack the church and its doctrines rather than to attack Jesus and his life. Raul replied, I don't care about convincing old people. It's young Peruvians who need to learn to hate Christ and all that he symbolizes. Oh, Raul, don't be so dismissive. Have you actually even read the Bible? Instead of answering, Raul declared, just remember what Marx said, religion is the opiate of the masses. Yes, but it doesn't mean there isn't anything to be learned from the Bible, she replied. One weekend afternoon, Raul took a bunch of familiar religious songs and substituted the names Marx, Lenin, and Mao for Jesus. He thought it was a creative way to try to convert Christians to the revolutionary cause. Pleased with himself, he proudly showed the doctored song sheets to my mother when she came home, confident she would be impressed by his brilliant idea. He was hoping to sing the song as part of his acts and maybe even sell copies on the street. It completely backfired. My mother was not only unimpressed, she was mad. You've turned Marxism into a religion. Rahl was stunned. Carola! It's just a tactic to politicize the masses. No, it merely perpetuates the cult of personality. Simply substituting Marx for Jesus is not progress toward the revolution, Raul. Angry, Raul lit a match under the song sheets until it caught fire right in the middle of the room. My mother and I both jumped. Raul, you're crazy, she screamed at him, stomping out the fire, ashes from, ashes from the burned sheets floating up and spreading across the room. You could have burned the whole place down. My mother and Raoul also quarreled, always without resolution, about what my mother called, quote, the root causes of machismo, unquote, and the origins of female oppression. Frustrated by my mother's persistent focus on the woman question, Raoul sometimes lashed out, telling her that, as a North American, 
She was la hija del imperialismo, the daughter of imperialism. She would then counter, well, Raul, always remember that you are not the most oppressed person in the world because you're not a woman. He never worked out an effective response to that line. One Saturday, several months after we moved to Okopia, their debate about female oppression lasted the entire day. They argued on the walk into town to take a hot shower. They argued while we were in the shower together. And they argued on the way back. It was as if I wasn't even there. That day, they got so mad at each other over their differing interpretations of female oppression that they decided to part ways on the walk home from our shower outing, Raul kicking at rocks in the road and storming off. When my mother saw that I had started to cry, she put her arm around my shoulder. Oh, Peter, don't get upset. Everything will be fine with Raul. And if it isn't well, we'll still be fine. After Raul returned home a few hours later, the arguments picked up where they had left off and continued into the night. As they tried to make up, my mother told Raul sincerely, I understand that you're just trying to get revenge against the Yankees. She then added, getting to know me it's your way of getting to know white imperialist society and seeing the enemy up close. Now, I'm not sure that really made Raul feel any better, but they did stop arguing, at least for that night. I'll switch gears a little bit. A year into being in Peru, um, we, had, we were broke, and my mother had not actually uh, ever had a financial settlement with my father over the divorce. So we had to go back uh, and uh, try to settle things with him. And it's hard for me to believe at this point, but at that particular point in my life, my Spanish was better than my English. And I didn't actually hardly know how to write in English. I was nine years old. So my mother was kind of pushing me to get up to speed since we were heading back to the US after being gone for a few years. And uh, so I penned a poem in English, maybe the only poem I've ever written in my life. So I thought I would read it. Nine years old, December, I think it was 74. I am poor and rich, and life is sometimes sad and sometimes marvelous. For me, it's both. The bathroom is full of shit. My mother is sick. My teacher never comes. And to me, they all call me gringo. All the older kids in the barrio beat me up. I'm nine years old. I'm first in my class. My shoe is torn. Life is sad, damn it. My mother is teaching me English. And that's good. Ciao. <laughs> After reading my poem, my mother smiled, folded it, gave me a kiss on my forehead. Thank you, Peter. I'll make sure to keep this. I would find it in her diary four decades later. All right, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but just a few more things. Well. Actually, let me skip forward. My, when we went back, came back to the United States, um, my mother, my father refused to negotiate a property settlement agreement um, unless my mother also was willing to have a, a custody battle over me. So she rolled the dice. She was broke. Um, somehow had confidence that she would not only get her settlement but win custody. She got her settlement, and she lost custody of me. So I moved into suburban Detroit with my father. Extraordinary change of lifestyle, as you can imagine, my father uh, and um, Rosalind, my stepmother. Uh, the trial was in August. Lost, uh, my mother lost custody. So I lived with them that fall, and my mother became, uh, she was living in Colorado at the time, uh, she became increasingly anxious, fearful, depressed, angry, 
and would write me uh, over and over again, um, warning me about the pitfalls of my new lifestyle. Here's a sample. It's pretty heavy stuff. Dear Peter, the judge and the lawyers are still playing around with me about the settlement money. I'm furious, and this makes it even more difficult accepting your incarceration by people who treat me so unjustly. I have written you many letters that I do not send because I imagine you will not want to hear about, your preoccup about my preoccupations. You want to be free to enjoy your new life as the king of the universe, and I don't know how to remind you that you are a child of the people. You do not see the people from where you are, and you st start to view the people as a threat to your privileged life. The rich waste their time accumulating and buying and guard against the poor. They may help the poor sometimes, but they will never want the poor to kick the rich out and take power. The thing that preoccupies me about you, Peter, is that you will fear the poor when the poor rebel, just like the rich always have. And rather than rejoice when the poor rebel, you are so far away from that, you would never see the rebellion. You are so far away from the realities of the world, Peter. You perhaps carry with you memories of what you once knew of the world, but that will fade if you stay there. And Peter, I very much hope you don't feel that your real home is with the rich. I know that they try day and night to make you feel that way, showing you photos of your previous life there, making you think that because your father entered my body one day to make you grow there, that this somehow gives him rights over your life. Carl, my father, is trying to get a hold of your passport. If the judge agrees to this and doesn't allow me to receive the money if I don't hand over the passport, we will have serious problems, Peter. Don't talk about this with them, Peter. It's very delicate. I just want to tell you this so you don't trust them too much. Rosalind, my stepmother, wants to give me rights and promises, but she doesn't have the power, and Carl is very slippery and manipulative, manipulative as always. You always love those who are around you, Peter. They treat you well. But you must also think about what you are losing if you stay there for years, how that will affect your mind, your attitudes, your personality. I continue to believe you are a sane boy, Peter. That's why you easily adjust to new experiences. But you now need to think very seriously whether you want to totally adapt to the life of luxury and security. Raul and I are a little bit crazy, for sure. We do not care at all about respectability. You have to think about why we have chosen to be this way. You can be stronger and more conscious from having spent a few months there or you can sell out to the experience without caring. It was a risk to leave you there. You are young to be risking your life, but you have lived much and you are not so innocent. I may visit you within weeks. Don't announce that. You are imprisoned there without knowing it. I love you, your mama. My mother wanted me to feel like I was in some sort of prison, but that's not how it felt to me. She wanted me to feel like I would be a sellout if I stayed with my father, and I feared she was right. I didn't know how to respond to that letter, so I didn't write back. All right, so the last thing I will read, which was probably the most sort of emotionally tortured moment of my childhood, was shortly after that letter and that time period, The warrant for my mother's arrest was issued by the Sheriff's Department a few hours after my teachers at Meadowbrook Elementary reported me missing from the playground. The official charge was, quote, enticing away child under 14 years of age, unquote. An all points bulletin with our descriptions was sent out by the police to authorities at airports, train stations, and bus stations. But it was too late. We had already crossed the border. I know exactly what I was wearing that day because it was recorded in the sheriff's incident report. Peter was last dressed in brown cowboy boots, blue jeans, a beige turtleneck shirt, gray sweater with a white stripe on the midriff, and a green ski coat with a fur-trimmed hood. These were my only clothes until we reached Peru a few weeks later. My father contacted the FBI and the State Department, but they told him that no extradition would be granted from Peru. 
I had finally agreed, however reluctantly, to collude in my own kidnapping, which took place at noon on Wednesday, December 10, 1975. When I sneaked out of the schoolyard during lunch recess, my mother was waiting for me outside the playground in a red VW Beetle, the engine running. She had disguised herself in oversized dark glasses and a thick black wig. I would not have recognized her if she had not waved to me from the driver's seat. I walked quickly toward the car and got in, and we sped off. Despite the cold, my mother's forehead was sweaty, and she looked pale against the heavy winter coat she'd wrapped around her slender frame. Everything go okay? My mother squeezed my hand as we turned the corner. No one suspects anything? I shook my head and squeezed her hand back. I didn't say anything, fearing my words would betray my ambivalence. We drove in silence. As we approached the Detroit-Windsor Tunnel, which runs under the Detroit River and links the United States to Canada, tears started rolling down my cheeks. My mother pulled over to the side of the road. Do you want to go back? We're almost at the border. She was trying hard, not to, hard to seem calm, but I heard the wobble in her voice. No, I replied, wiping away my tears with my coat sleeve. I wanted to be in the car with my mother right then, but I also wanted to still be running around the playground back at school. I did not look at my mother, fearing she would see the indecision in my eyes. She did not press me. She maybe realized she'd get a different answer if she asked again. I changed the subject, teasing. You look really goofy with that big puffy wig and those ugly glasses. I'd never seen my mother in glasses and the wig made her head seemed huge. She laughed, started the car again. Yeah, you're right, I'll take this thing off as soon as we've crossed into Canada. We made it to Peru uh, a few weeks later, to Lima. I'll just read one more, a couple more paragraphs. We made it to Lima by Christmas, some two weeks after we fled Michigan. I was back in Peru, but my mind was still straddling two worlds. We spent that Christmas dancing and lighting fireworks with Raul's family, his mother, Berta, his sister, Victoria, three brothers, Lucho, Carlos, and Juan, at their small home at the outer edges of Villa Salvador, a sprawling shanty town of several hundred thousand inhabitants on the southern outskirts of Lima. My mother and I were warmly welcome. Their home had no Christmas decorations or trees with presents underneath, but this did not dampen the family's festive mood lubricated by beer and aguardiente. A few years earlier, Villa El Salvador had been nothing more than an empty desert when squatters from Lima's overcrowded slums organized a nighttime takeover in bold defiance of the government. When the police came to evict them and tear down their makeshift shacks, the squatters refused to move. Wishing to avoid a potentially bloody confrontation, the government eventually relented, and the trickle of new squatters turned into a flood of thousands of people rushing to stake out plots of land. Though the sandy, harsh terrain was not exactly welcoming, squatters were attracted to the prospect of open land not far from the capital. Villa El Salvador had no electricity or running water. Tanker trucks came by once a week to fill up the two rusty 50-gallon metal bar barrels in front of Berta's straw mat shack. The toilet was a hole in the sand in a screened off area with old newspapers for toilet paper and a can of lime powder to dissolve the shit. With no street lights to illuminate the sand streets and keep the muggers at bay, it was dangerous to go out at night. We all slept together on straw filled mattresses and woke up with our legs covered in itchy flea bites. I intensely missed my flea free bed, Saturday morning cartoons and frosted flakes but I resisted saying that to my mother. And this time, unlike our first arrival in South America more than three years earlier, I knew what to expect and adapted without complaint. Thank you.
So, um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is just maybe kick off the conversation by asking Peter uh, uh, a, a couple of questions, and that was fantastic and, and really very, very powerful, um, uh, especially uh, the reading, um, which is great. So, let me ask just a couple, and then we'll open it up. Um, the reason why I, th I think this is such an amazing book is that it kind of weaves together several complex stories. You know, on the one hand, it uh, gives us a very personal window into a series of uh, political events, whether it's the coup in uh, Chile or what it was like in Berkeley in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, uh, and then back uh, sort of alternative uh, radical politics, uh, whether it was uh, in, um, in Denver. So that, that on the one hand, you have that, and it's a really interesting take into that period of of uh, American and global uh, political life. On the other hand, it's an intensely personal story, as we just heard. Um, and it's a story of uh, quite a chaotic uh, childhood, uh, you know, certainly very untraditional. Um, your mom, you talked about Raul, but there were many relationships uh, uh, that uh, you were involved in, you know, kidnappings more than once, uh, and, uh, and putting in, you in some positions that were not just untraditional, but sometimes actually um, dangerous, if not uh, certainly inappropriate. So very different from the norms of childhood that, uh, that we normally uh, think of. Um, and yet, what was so interesting, so when I first read this and I was reading, I read a couple drafts, but certainly the very first draft, and I was reading about some of these untraditional childhood experiences, and as a parent, I was on the one hand very angry for Peter. And I thought, like, God, I can't believe that you you know, experienced this and you were put in this position. And on the other hand, the, the shift of emotion changed to the incredible love uh, that uh, existed, that your mom had for you and that existed between you, the incredible loyalty and the way that she was challenging you, even as a young boy, to think beyond yourself and stuff like that. So it's, it's a truly interesting, complex story. And so I guess I wanted to ask you, how did this childhood shape your approach first to you being a parent of young children, to parenting, mm. uh, and how uh, to, uh, to the way you think about uh, uh, that? And also, how, does it, how did it maybe uh, shape the kinds of topics that you choose to work mm. on, the way you do your professional life? I mean, I, I can guess, All but right. it'd be good to hear from, from you. Thank you, Rick. Great questions. Um, a lot to, to chew on. Um, I mean, <clears throat> one way I was, you know, the, the, the contrast you started out with, which is sort of shocking, but also a lot of love, you know, as I put it in the very end of the book, um, and, I, and it's an epilogue, and I actually partly wrote an epilogue because you said you need an epilogue for this book, so I, it's there. Um, I, the, the one-liner would be, um, my mother was incredibly negligent sometimes, but I never felt neglected, right? So there's a big difference. And so I always felt the love, once definitely felt it wanted. I mean, geez, years fighting over me, right? Um, in terms of, you know, reflecting on parenting, um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm doing everything the opposite, probably, of what my mother did, and maybe because of that, or maybe I would have done it that way anyway. In that regard, I'm probably more on my, on, toward my father's end of things. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't, I mean, one lesson from the book, arguably, is there's no right way to parent. And things that seem kind of extreme and completely wacko from our perspective today, Maybe we're still a kind of extreme back then, but less so. Um, the context really does matter. And I think we've lost something that kids can't go outdoors and play in the streets and that you have to kind of surveil everything they're doing. And you're actually considered a criminal if you, if you don't watch over them every minute. So maybe we've gone the opposite direction too much in that regard, uh, including myself, frankly. Um, your last question, which was how does this shape sort of what I work on and do. It wasn't really until I did this book that it dawned on me that, you know, I work on borders and smuggling and 
illicit trade and clandestine crossings and it's like, ah. <laughs> it's kind of it's it's so obvious in some ways because I didn't read the stories but my mother actually used me as a smuggler in getting out of Chile she she wanted to sneak out these political mementos and so as we were crossing the border into Bolivia the Chilean soldiers were frisking everybody but I was only eight years old and I was by my mother's side and so they didn't frisk me and they just waved me through and but basically she used me to, to carry a political poster out. That if they, they would have confiscated it, who knows, maybe they would have given us a hard time. But uh, when we left after um, that last story that I read about the sort of abduction, um, the settlement money was all in cash. And so Raul and she and I, we went, well, we were in Canada, but then we were crossing into Mexico. And she sewed these pockets into my pants. and his to carry tens of thousands of dollars with us. And, you know, so here I'm basically smuggling cash into Mexico. Um, so, coincidence that I study this stuff now? Maybe, but I don't think so. It's just, I never, but it, I never put it together. It's kind of interesting that I never really, yeah. Great. Anyway. Let me ask a, another question, which is um, what you began uh, the, the presentation on how you started the project. Um, so you uh, discover this cache of, uh, of, of notebooks and diaries. And my memory is that you read them not just initially, but then you went back years later and reread them and started uh, this project. And given how different this is from the other things that you've written, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about like the process through which you went from reading your mom's diaries then revisiting them a number of years later, yeah. and then trying to imagine how you would translate this into this uh, wonderful memoir. Yeah, I know. The initial impulse was um, reading backwards in time, re catching up with my mother's life from literally the moment she died. Um, but then when I turned to this, to kind of, I start with the beginning of the diaries decades earlier, so it's the opposite. And, you know, the initial reading after she died, I was in the midst of, of, you know, scrambling for tenure here at Brown. I, 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 I had to put them aside. I had to say, go cold turkey. I'm not reading these diaries anymore and put them into storage. So I didn't dig them out until years later. And then I started reading from the beginning to the present, um, but especially focusing on those years together in South America. And first I used them as a, as a kind of source of information and, and details of where we were and places and names and so on. Uh, but then as I got into it, I realized um, it's a much richer story if I actually weave the diaries into the narrative itself. So her commenting on something about us being broke, but at the time I had no idea we were broke or you know, her reflections on something and me remembering it differently. And then I comment on the, in the, in the book that, that we had these differing interpretations of things. Um, so I th it was, yeah, so in other words, it wasn't just sort of background material for writing my book, but it became part of the book. I should say it wasn't just her diaries, it was her letters and correspondence and, and her own books that she had written. Um, and my father, had kept, he's a meticulous record keeper, he had kept every piece of paper related to the custody battle, every correspondence with lawyers and my mother and so on, and put them in two fat folders for his own sake. And then when I told him I was doing this book, he, he doesn't talk much about this stuff, but he handed me those folders and, I, you know, used, those were extraordinarily valuable uh, as well. I wouldn't have had the, I, you know, in preparation for this book or in the process of doing it, I read tons of memoirs, childhood memoirs, and there's f fabulous ones out there, something I hadn't really done before. I was a complete rookie in this, in this realm. But it astonished me to the degree to which people can write childhood memoirs without raw material to, to draw on. I just, I, I needed those diaries to do the job. That's great. And one last question, um, and then we'll open it up. 
this book, I think, is so powerful because um, you open yourself up. You share all sorts of memories and emotions and experiences that most academics, you know, would never share. Certainly not in uh, in their traditional published uh, work. What's that been like for you? Well, the first few drafts of this um, were more purely descriptive, basically. This is how it was. This is what happened. This is where we went. This is why we were there. Kind of a distant narrator of just sort of. But the pushback I got from from editors and and, and readers, um, including from you, I think, um, was don't just tell us what you did, but what you were thinking um, and what you think of it now. Um, and so you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable new terrain to um, write about that and put it out there. I think I had to write the straight factual narrative first to then hang the emotional stuff onto, um, just sort of that was my, was most comfortable doing, but I think the book is hopefully more, I don't know, uh, deeper in some way by having that, that as el emotional element, but it's, um, yeah, that was hard. Um, it was, you know, the hardest writing I've ever done, by far. Great. Thanks. Let's open it up. Uh, so, Peter, you want me to call him? Sure, please. Okay, so let's start with Lena over there. And if, if you can just wait for the microphone because of the taping. So, Peter, thank you so much. I, uh, I came just to hear about your mother. And um, I think it's um, to share somebody so, with whom you are so intimate with the public, uh, it, it really needs a kind of stress that, uh, strength that some of us as academics don't have. And I really, I appreciate what you've done. So I wanted to ask you the question that I was asked when I showed the film about my mother. Uh, actually, the same person who's sitting next to you asked me this question. He said, how do you feel having shared your mother with everybody? Um, and it's a, it's a question I never thought about. Um, there was an uncomfort. Uh, I was very uncomfortable about actually letting the film out after sitting on it for eight years. But I think um, I, it achieved something. And I wonder if the same thing happens to you, that you, it, it has to have either strengthened you or taken a huge weight out of your shoulder. And I, I, I want to ask you the same question. As, as a son, how was it for you to share your mother? And basically, that's what I also did, to share my own mother with people I never thought I would could do that with? Big question. Um, it feel, it's hard, but it feels good. I mean, basically, I, there was this kind of, as I think you put it just now, it's sort of a, kind of a bit of a weight lifted. Um, I, you know, I couldn't have written this book if she was still alive. Um, I couldn't have written it for partly because the diaries wouldn't are accessible to me, but I also don't think I was in a position to do it, and it would be too difficult. Um, I, I'm i happy to, sh to, I feel like I know her better than anyone else in the world. And so she's a complex person. I think a lot of people um, only knew part of her. Um, some people misunderstood her. Um, and I think this is, um, you know, a fuller, deeper story. Um, I think she would have disagreed with she would have loved to argue me with about this book, probably, but she'd be glad that it, she'd be glad that I wrote it. I think. Great, Nina. So this was a wonderful presentation. I've known Peter since grad school, which is over twenty years, and until this book came out, I had no idea that he had such a wild childhood. So, one question is: How did you turn out so normal? Uh, so uh, maybe I'll make that a little bit, bit more, more, more scholarly, but I, I'm actually curious about your relationship to your mother's ideology. That is, what did you think about all this radical ideology at the time and, and later as you got older? I mean, did you, has it affected you, um, leftist ideologies? Did you reject it all? I mean, where, 
what was your relationship to that? Yeah, no, as a, as a, as a child, I was kind of a, a, a true believer in the sense that I was, it was part of the fun and it was, you know, exciting and we'd sing the revolutionary songs and, and I got really very tired of the arguing. But, you know, she, just an example, in 1976, we just moved back to the United States. We were living in Denver. Mo, you know, uh, uh, Ford Carter presidential elections, November. Um, you know, she sends me to school. They're having a mock election at my elementary school. And she sends me to school with a, with a sign to put up at the, at the rally that says, don't vote. <laughs> so I'm a, you know, I'm an 11 year old kid. It, everyone's Carter, you know, Mon Carter Mondale. And I'm like, don't vote. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I'm not just the messenger. I believe the message. But, the, you know, this, this is fifth grade. Um, I had a political break with my mother um, in college after I left, after I left, uh, you know, so everyone rebels from their, from their parents in some form or fashion at some point. And as I put it in the book, for me, childhood re rebellion was to not be a, become a rebel. Like, right, it was kind of, so by her standards, I was a conformist, reformist, I don't know if she'd use the word reactionary, but, um, but it was, it was hard. And that's back to the issue of reading the diaries. I did not realize until reading the diaries how hurt she was that I had, you know, sold out in some ways by having a mainstream life and career and so on. So that was, and I quote from that in the, towards the end of the book. Uh, yeah. Great. Shireen? So thanks so much, Peter. So first, just to comment, you're such a good reader, so I hope you do the audio version. I hope that's you <laughs> who reads it. Oh. Um, so I was thinking about people who's minority or ethnic or racialized or class identities are already so stigmatized on like bad parenting, bad families, broken family, especially the scene about, you know, the lice and the being peed on. And I wondered, you know, your position as a middle class, white, heterosexual, sexist, <laughs> gendered, you know, Christian um, is really different from somebody like, you could be a Muslim American today and write my mother the jihadi, you know, book and it wouldn't be the same thing, right? Um, or, you know, a, a racialized minority where like you're already so stigmatized as people who can't properly parent. So I wondered if that position made you feel sort of safe that you could um, come out with these details or were you worried that you would lose that kind of status that you had? Huh. Um, it's probably an unsatisfying uh, or disappointing answer that from my perspective, I was not, ref I was not particularly self-reflective that I am a white man telling a story about my white mother. Um, I felt like I was just telling it like it is and how I felt it, but it, until you asked this question, it didn't even occur to me to think, well, if I was of a different race or gender or class telling the same story, how would it come across to others? Having said that, I mean, class is a tricky question in this case because my mother was well educated, but we were dirt poor many, much of the time. So, and the people in our milieu were, you know, often similar or much, much worse. So, I, I did not feel like I was some middle class, middle America, or, or wealthy. And in fact, when I lived with my father briefly, my mother, as you could tell from that letter, she gave me a really hard time for worry that I was self-identifying with upper class. Um, so I'll have to think more about um, your question, which I thank you for. Great. Other questions? <clears throat> yes. Um. Peter, uh, uh, I come from a Middle West Mennonite background. So when it said your mother was Mennonite, 
I know a little bit about the Mennonites, particularly the Mennonites who uh, broke away from the Hutterites when they came here in the 1870s. Was your mother of that ilk or another kind? And knowing what I know about the Mennonites, very solid families, women are greatly respected, and education isn't that important, but pretty important because you had to read the Bible. So could you give us some background about your mother and what broke her away from that tradition that she became this uh, traveling uh, radical? I'm glad you asked that question because I realize there's only so much you can cover in a sh you know, short period of time and I chose certain things to read and not others. But I mean, one of the more astonishing parts of the story is my mother was a pacifist Mennonite from a town of 5,000 people in central Kansas founded in the 1870s, um, where everybody around her were Mennonites. Um, very traditional. Um, everybody w went to the same Mennonite college, which was local, Bethel College, populate, you know, 500 students, I think. You didn't venture out much. If you did, you went to other Mennonite communities in the Midwest, in Minnesota, and, and, and elsewhere. Um, I wouldn't call it a completely closed, you know, society or community, but it, it was somewhat in, Intermarry, a lot of intermarrying and, and, and so on. And part of what attracted her to my father, they, she was 14. When they met, he was 21. They dated once a week, held hands, kissed for the first time three years later, um, got married when she was 17. She rushed through college by 19 so that she could be with him. But part of what attracted her to him was that he wasn't as religious as a lot of other people. His mother wanted her, him to become a minister and he didn't want to. And they both aspired to go to graduate school, which in their case meant going out of state. And so he was kind of her ticket out of town. Uh, and, you know, her, her family was a little, you know, don't have time to get into the details. Her family was a little different than your typical Mennonite family in town, but still, I mean, you, you know, you don't dance, you don't, you don't play cards, you don't, you know, yeah, the, the, the dances at the high school are there, but they're for the kids from the other side of town and so on. Um, but she was itching to get out, and, um, and my father facilitated that, and he didn't want to stick around either. Um, so my, my father now has is, is moved back. Yeah. He's, back He's back there with, with my st uh, stepmother, Rosalind. They're back there, yes. Okay. My father was asked at 18 whether he wanted to continue the church or play baseball on Sunday, but he couldn't do both. There you go. So I was always grateful my father chose baseball. <laughs> yes, my, my mother, my, one of my mother's first questions to my father was, what do you play? And he's not athletic at all, so he smiled and said, I play the radio. <laughs> so he had a car, and it did have a radio. So. Brigo. So actually, like Nina's question, mine has a speculative element and then a scholarly ending. But I just want to pick up on the point Shireen was making and just think about how we would think further on that, which is not to say that any particular identity is privileged or not. But it suddenly struck me that there has emerged around the time of the economic crash, there emerged a whole series of sort of films and TV series about sort of a white suburban beginning from which someone takes flight. Uh, mother and children, for example. Weeds is the most classic. I don't know if you ever saw Weeds. It was very popular, yes. So you know what I'm talking about. All oh, like uh, Adventure, the Jim Carrey film. A whole genre of the sort of comedy of not a depression, but of an economic crash in which a family sort of takes flight. Uh, but is it the case, I'm wondering, that uh, a certain kind of identity can take flight, and the difference between what Shireen is saying or what this would be, is that there is a home to return to, or that there is some sense in which there is an, a stable normal to which one can take flight and return. So the scholarly aspect of the question, I'm wondering if, if we don't think of just the left as ideology, uh, the playground and Detroit, uh, do you think of that? Uh, was that home, or do you feel estranged from that as well, or did you rebel against that, or would you mm -hmm. characterize that as an ideology too, or was that, is that simply the normal? Uh, and how would we think about where you returned after you took flight? Yeah, good question. I mean, the, the, the permanent imprint 
of this experience in terms of a, a home is to not have an intense attachment to any place. I don't, I by default, when people ask me where you're from, I say Denver, Colorado, because that's where I went to high school and junior high and, and so on, spent the longest period of my life at that point. Um, but I don't really feel like I'm from anywhere. Um, and my mother, she could have never returned to Kansas. Absolutely not. And I certainly, returning to Detroit, I left when I was five. I wasn't, that wasn't something I thought, oh, com it wasn't like a comfort zone. But to, what do you mean place? I mean, ideologically, what's that? Remain home. Ideologically remained home? I, d I don't know if this answers your question. I developed a strong urban bias, if that's what you mean. Um, Regardless of where I was, I always wanted to be in cities. Um, but I. What? Hmm? Maybe what? I can like elaborate. Or, um, Let's get the yeah, microphone. Let's just get the microphone for a second. Whether the playground is a metaphor for the type of home that is your true home as a um, whatever identity you have, whether the the playground or your father's home is feels like your real home that that your fam you and your mother took flight from that but then that feels like what you were always wanting to get back to or you could get back to that's a possibility for you and maybe in a way that's not for other people like the people that you met in South America <laughs> at no point in this story did I have a longing to get back to something. It was always a moving forward story. And I never felt nostalgic or wishing I stayed somewhere. Doesn't mean where I was was necessarily perfect or wonderful or whatnot, but um, yeah, so I don't know if that gets to, I mean the playground metaphor, it's not just metaphor, it's, it's it's real. In the U.S. there are playgrounds, and in Latin America the playground was the street always, and actually that's a better playground because you but want. What, I mean, what we're asking is what anchors you into the world that you can oh. be normal again. Do you see the the depth oh, of the question that Shireen has posed? You can be normal again. Exactly. <laughs> I have trouble with that word normal. I. <clears throat> I've always felt like a misfit, and I, I guess I feel sort of normal now, but I'm, I don't feel, I still feel like a misfit. That's okay. Um, but I, I actually <laughs> am, am, am jealous of people who have a deep sense of um, belonging to something or a place or whatnot, because I, it never developed for me. Question right here. Peter, um, the the Carol in the book was was not the Carol that I knew. Um, there were there were pieces of it, and uh, you know I realize you're so right when you say people are so complicated and you don't always know um, who a person who a person really is. And I didn't know what you were going through in Denver in your childhood. And after I read the, the draft that I first read and I met with you, I think I was crying. And I said, I am so sorry that I didn't do anything to help. And um, um, Carol was one of, one of my best friends ever. Um, a huge influence in my life and in the book the the clunky polemics I never really cared for her clunky polemics I, I they were sort of a little offshoot that you just sort of steer away from um, she was just such an extremely decent person in my life um, and I'm just wondering the people that knew Carol, your brothers and, and the people that knew Carol, 
can you talk a little bit about people's reactions to the book? I mean, I love the book, and I am so proud of you, and it is so incredible that you wrote it. Um, but I think that um, there are so many other ways other than some of the things that have just been said here today that are even in the book of knowing her and knowing what a principled, generous, spirited, um, thoughtful about everything, connected, really decent person she also was. And I'm, I'm not saying I, I'm not doubting the veracity of anything that has that you've said or you've written, but how have people that knew her and loved her reacted? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, this is Claire. Um, she's actually mentioned in in, in the book um, uh, as close friends in Denver, um, when, especially in the, the early years we were there. Um, you know, my brother, I, my oldest, this is partly a, a sort of only child story because um, uh, I have two older brothers, but they're much older than me, so most of the story, just it's just my mother and myself. But my oldest brother, um, Joel, uh, who read it many t multiple times at different stages of the process, um, he, uh, extremely supportive, but just, you know, disagrees with me of interpretation. So he's much more sympathetic to my mother's politics and um, decisions and, and so on. Um, so, you know, I, but he'd be the first to say, Peter, you experienced it differently than I did. And so therefore, it's fine. It's just, right? It's, he was much older and he experienced it differently. He didn't, the downside wasn't as serious for him. Um, other people who knew my mother well, not that many people, frankly, have 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 read this yet, and I'm bracing for the for the reaction. <laughs> in in fact, um, I'm giving a talk uh, in Denver uh, next month uh, at the bookstore across the street from my old high school, and there will be a number of my mother's old friends there who may or may not have looked at the book yet. Um, you know, one of her sisters has, has read the book um, uh, and mostly was supportive and, um, yeah, but not that many people have, have, have read it, so I'm, I'm holding my breath. Uh, but, you know, I have to say, I, I, sh I didn't write this book always thinking, God, what are people going to say if I, if I write this? Or I better say it this way because so-and-so will react. I had to really kind of push that. As, you know, when going through final drafts, sure, I polished out some of the edges, but I did not want to write a book thinking the entire time, what are people going to say who knew her or, yeah. So. Great. I think we have time for maybe one, one last question over here. Um, I understand that you and your mother uh, experience all these events together. Um, <clears throat> so I wonder how, in your writing, how you reconcile your perspective uh, with your mother's. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, her, her, her perspective is on paper in the diaries and from my conversations with her and her letters and uh, the book is written from my perspective. Um, I, this is why she would probably argue with me about it if she was alive today. Um, but at the same time, it is our story, right? So, but I did not try to weave, well, her perspective is woven into some degree because of introducing the diaries as this thread that helps hold the whole book together. So people do get her perspective on things that way. But ultimately, 
it's my story, even though, frankly, she's the far more interesting person in the book. Okay. Great. I'm sure there can be more conversation in the reception uh, outside following this. Please join me in thanking Peter for sharing this wonderful story. And thank you all for coming. That was great. great. Thank you. That was really great. Really great. I think you have people in tears that are reading.